I'll wait just a minute for Facebook to push this out, then I'll start. Hey, George Washington. Good to see you here. Kay Fairchild, good morning. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> we have several with us now, or a few, so we'll go ahead and start. Uh, appreciate you being with us at Tree of Life Ministries. We're here to, to serve you what we call the bread and wine. I call it the truthful word, hi Connie. And uh, hope that you are being blessed by what you receive from us, and particularly Kay Fairchild also. I know you guys, a lot of you all follow her too, so uh, I hope you're being blessed by both of us and you're receiving a word that will affect your life. We, it's uh, one thing to set and hear a good, exciting message, but it's got to affect your life, and that's what we want for what we share with you guys. So <clears throat> again, we're, we're glad you're here. Uh, if you follow our teachings, you know uh, we study and we interpret the scriptures first and foremost from the lens of Father's eternal love for all people, uh, and that's forever, that's from eternity. Uh, sometimes when I see people comment on my scripture, it seems like they don't believe that Father loves everyone, but Father does, and uh, there is no but to it. Father just loves everyone, and Father is one with everyone. And next, we possess an understanding that scripture, basically when you look at scripture, you've got to uh, determine what awareness it's from, because that's what it's about. It's about an awareness. You know, you either have a carnal awareness or you have a spiritual awareness. And then we also teach from a parabolical, an allegorical, a uh, metaphorically, and a symbolical understanding of the word. And those are all based on spiritual understanding. So as we continue, we started, uh, this would be my fifth lesson out of uh, if, uh, Romans. And uh, we started with chapter 1, and we're going to be in verse 25 today and go all the way to 32. And so the apostle continued here with what people did from the foundation of the world. And so I, when I translated this, I translated it from the, the original words in the Greek and the order that it was in. But also we've got to understand that there's a spiritual understanding or metaphorically understanding or allegorical understanding to these scriptures that's more important to us than just the literal. And so in Romans 1.25, if you have my Romans translation with you, you want to read from there and follow. It's that they willfully exchange the truth of the one loving father into falsehood. They ascertained salt and desired to know Father's creation instead of Father. They rendered homage to that which Father created, worshiping themselves, which worship means ascertain, seek, and desire to know. So they worship themselves and all things created more than our Father, who is to be spoken well of for eternity. So be it. Verse 26, from the act I wrote of, those who lived at the foundation of the world, they themselves... Uh, of those who lived at the foundation world, they themselves gave up Father for their conspicuous desires, uh, for dishonoring and disgracing women, exchanging their natural sexual intercourse into that which is against natural reproduction. And then verse 27, similarly, the men leaving the natural sexual intercourse with women were set on fire with lust one for another, men using men by implication for sexual indecency, and the consequences resulted in themselves being that they were bound with that they receive the deceitful delusion. Now, least people think that I'm teaching against homosexu homosexuality and lesbianism. I'm not doing that. I can't tell you I agree with it, but I'm not teaching against them because God loves them just as much as God loves us. They're righteous and holy just as much as us. So as I pointed out earlier, uh, these verses, I, the, in, in our earlier teaching, these verses seem to be the favorite verses that people go to to preach against and condemn homosexuals and condemn all manners of, of what they call sin. So there is a more important way to understand what the Apostle Paul taught and understood from the allegorical understanding. I talked to Kay last week about this. So I'm going to share uh, some of what she shared with me too. So in Romans 1, 26-27, Paul was not referring to physical or the actual act of homosexuality, but to people who are only magnifying the spirit part of man or the masculine principle man. He also wrote of the women which would be magnifying the soul part, simply exalting, if you would, mind over matter, thinking of mere positive thinking, or opposed to subjectively joining the masculine and feminine together as one, because we are one. And, you know, we talk about the right brain, left brain. Kay teaches more of that than I do. 
but they saw themselves as separate. They were more interested in the separate parts. Most people were, were more interested in the soulish part. And then there were people that's only interested in the spiritual part. And that's all they're concerned with. And not realizing that we are one, that we are whole. So those who did it, do this typically are people who would believe in a little rapture, rapture. And they think it's only about getting the spirit saved and, and bringing the renewed mind to our feminine part is not necessary. Uh, you know, the Bible talks, uh, set, Paul said, be ye transformed by the renewing mind, not the renewing of the mind. They added the word of. Hi, Norma. We miss you a lot. I'm glad you're here with us. And so uh, the feminine part, uh, in other words, there was never any necessity to correct that or change that or if you would renew that. And then we have those who teach that it's all about the woman part, like planting the seed into the soul and thereby getting things, if you would. And all of you have been in churches or most of you where it's all about getting something. You know, you, you pay your tithe, you give your money, and then you're going to get a new car or whatever it is you want. It's always about getting things. And rather than coming to know Father, and you can't know Father until the two together experience the I'mness, is what Kay calls it, and subjectively experience the fruit that remains. Uh, I, I grew up predominantly in a charismatic church, and so most of it was all about the Spirit, all about you know, uh, and, and sp spending time talking about the Holy Spirit. And I, I have a friend that has a church that that's what they do. They always talk about Holy Spirit, but they never talk about Father. And it's all about Father. So Kay said this would be called religious lesbianism or religious homosexuality. And they totally dis uh, disregarded the parable of the sower where Jesus said to plant the seed into the ground. And the ground is our conscious awareness. Would you agree with that? That's where the ground is. That's where everything grows. So whatever comes in your conscious awareness and you embrace it and you receive it, then that's going to be projected out of your life and also out of your actions. So most of the time when scripture uses the word heart, almost every time it refers to one's awareness. The English word heart is used first in Genesis 6, 5 in the King James Version and the others. And it records, and God saw the badness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination and thoughts of their awareness was only bad continually. And the King James has said, their heart. But it was their awareness. It was always bad continually. And God saw that. And uh, the Hebrew word leb, L-E-B, which is translated as heart, it actually means feelings, intellect, and will, and awareness. And yes, labs sometimes can be talked about the heart in man, but the truth is there's no one that has a wicked organ called a heart, right? So it has to be something different than just our heart. It's our awareness. So more accurately, it's one's feelings, it's one's intellect, it's one's will, it's the awareness being bad, which is translated in the Hebrew word as raw, which means bad, not evil. Uh, the King James loves to use the word evil. There's no such word as evil in Scripture. It's always bad. And so the first place the, the, word, English, uh, the, word, the English word heart is used in the New Testament is in Matthew 5, 8. And Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So a better, a better translation of Matthew 5, 8 means happy, well-off, Supremely blessed, fortunate, well-off is one who has a clear understanding and awareness because the one God they shall see with their open eye, their wide open eye. Other people put use that scripture, the King James, if you don't have a pure heart, you're never going to see God. That means you're not going to go to heaven, right? That, that's what they would teach you. But that's not what that says when you translate it. It means we're going to, sh we're going to see, we're going to understand our Father with, with our, a wide open eye, and I'm talking about the single eye. So Jesus said, let not your awareness, not your heart, let not your awareness, thoughts and feelings be troubled. You believe in Father, believe also in me. And that's John 14 and 1. So when Jesus gave his life for and as man, it revealed an awareness. Jesus was trying to show us something. Again, he didn't, he didn't die for Father. Uh, Father didn't kill Jesus. The, the, the Jewish leaders did and they took him to the Roman, Roman leaders and the Romans became the instrument of his death. So what Jesus was doing was correcting our awareness and showing the true nature of Father and the love of Father towards mankind. So furthermore, he revealed the oneness that we always possess. We, we have never not been one with Father. It's just like my children, they will never not be one with me because they have my DNA. 
Well, I like to say we have the divine nature activity of the Father in us, and it's always been there. But in most of us, it lay dormant for a long time until somebody came and helped us wake up. <clears throat> so when the first race of Adam listened to their sense realm, they doubted and they decided for themselves that they had done something which caused them to lose, if you would. They, they said we were naked. They thought they lost the, law, uh, the life of Father. But this did not change Father's mind about mankind. Our Father was not caught off guard. You know, Father asked him a question, which I'll talk about that in a minute, which all you know is who told you that. But Father continued to chase him where it says he put skin on them. It says a, a coat or clothing. He continued to chase them and clothe them with who they were. He continued to try to correct their awareness. He sent prophets. He sent where it said angels of the Lord, that's messengers of the Lord. He sent people constantly to try to correct them. But the problem was then, and it continues today, is a person, as a person thinks in his or her heart, which again is the conscious awareness, so is his or her experience. So as you continue to believe the false thing that you were taught, you see yourself as just flesh and blood. You see yourself as carnal. Then you go after those parts of you to bring satisfaction. And that's what is pictured in the, the homosexuals and the lesbians and what people did at the foundation. They went after whatever brought them sensual pleasure. And again, that's where many people are today. Most of my charismatic raising, the entire teaching from pastors emphasized was mainly on getting one's spirit saved, getting your soul saved, and also getting filled with the Holy Ghost. And again, a lot of people major on that, but never knowing my spirit and soul are one. My whole being, I am one. I am a whole being. I am not separate. And I was already rescued at my birth. Uh, one with Father, if you would. I was eternally holy when I came out of my mother's womb, and I never lost it at all. Actually, when I was in my mother's womb. So I and you or a whole person, we're not a three-part being. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, I never heard about the renewing mind. I always heard about the renewing of the mind. So, there's a difference there. The renewing mind is our divine mind. We only have one mind. So, if we only have one mind as divine mind, then why do I need to renew it? Why do I need to correct it? I don't. I need to renew my awareness, if you would. And so there's a big difference there. So I don't have to do something. Paul said, be ye transformed by the renewing mind, which is we, we listen, we tune into the divine mind within inside of us. <clears throat> so that's the truth. Whether man has an awareness of the truth or a lie, there's still a truth there that they have the divine mind in them. And so we all have the mind of contact, if you would. The mind, <clears throat> the mind of contact is a powerful thing. Whatever you're in contact with, it's powerful. I use the, the electricity in here. We have all kinds, and you do too, all kinds of devices that run on electricity, but they have to do something to operate. What do they have to do? They have to contact electricity. So we plug it in. So we already have the divine mind. We don't have to get it. We don't have to go somewhere to get it, but we have to plug our awareness into that. We have to consciously, day after day, remind ourselves that Father is our source and that's what we're going to pay attention to. And that's what happened to the people at the foundation. They forgot and people have continued to do that. Not because they did, but they continue to do that because they have believed the lies of religiosity and they still worship the creation rather than the creator. So uh, in 1 John 2.20, it says we have an unction of the of the of the uh, uh, the Holy One, excuse me, I'm, I'm messing my thought. I'm trying to think ahead while I'm talking. <laughs> we have an unction of the Holy One and we know all things. Well, when you look at that word unction, it's the same word that they translated Christ and it's actually contact. So it says we have contact with Father, He's the Holy One, and we know all things. There's nothing that we don't need to know. Now, I know that word things re represents Logos. It's the living Word of God. But it also affects the knowledge that we have out in the world today. A lot of people don't give credit to Father for what they've discovered, but the, all these new inventions, all the medical devices, all them, every treatment that's given that's bringing help to us, it came from Father. Would you agree with that? Because there is no other knowledge. So the King James Version says, but you have an unction of the Holy One and you know all things. But we've got to understand our awareness will produce and project 
after any seed or any thought that's sown into that. So that's why Paul said, you know, this is the way they were from the foundation of the world. This is the way you were acting because you embraced relig religiosity. So why don't you uh, allow the renewing mind to change your awareness? Why don't you get, uh, get involved and, uh, and allow the voice of God to begin to speak to you? And so what happened is that projected and, and, and they sowed it. So even though man is not, uh, we are not the first race of man today, we still act like it. It's not that it was passed on down to us, but religion has taught us the same thing that they taught uh, the first race of men. What is that? Good or bad? Real, true? Almost every church that you've ever gone to, they taught the knowledge of good and bad, and then we embraced it. We saw ourselves as that way, and then what happened? We, we saw ourselves as naked. And so we lived unaware of our true Father. So Father equipped Jesus by speaking to his thoughts. And because Jesus stayed in contact with Father, he stayed in his original birth state, which was one with Father. Uh, by Mary, his mother, teaching him. She was taught by the scenes and she, she had great knowledge. And Father told her when it said that she was set apart, at, at literally Father told her to keep Jesus set apart from the Jewish teachings, and she did. And uh, then uh, he was taught by the scenes. And he learned a lot. And what it did is it revealed the divine purpose of Father for all mankind. And it revealed to him that man was always holy, always pure, always sacred, always righteous, and one with God. And all that took place before he was 12 years old. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. And yet it takes most of us 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years of life just to get a little revelation. Because we're not tapping into our divine mind. So Father equipped Apostle Paul's will as Jesus revealing his awareness of people who thought they were separate from Father. And there are so many people today that still believe that way. They still believe, ministers still believe that they're separate from Father. They still believe in a Trinity and they put the Trinity up above us. And they believe Jesus is higher than us and greater than us. And they keep us down here on this plane, if you would, where we feel like we're naked all the time. So... With Paul's letters, he was explaining the false conscious awareness that was, be, that was at the beginning, and they possessed it, and how Father never turned away from anyone whatsoever. Father continued to chase him, as I said. He sent, he sent the truth by prophets. He sent the truth by comforter messengers. Yet the people continued in their own awareness, their own intellect, and their own feelings, and they really had no time to listen or read their writings. I hear that today all the time. It amazes me how people respond to me on Facebook and they want a real quick answer. Not the majority of the people that follow us. I've got about 6,000 people that follow us and the majority of them are embracing what we're teaching. But there are always some that come to my page, they send me a friend request, but they're pastors of certain denominations and then when they find out what I teach, it's very difficult for them. They want me to give them a quick answer and I'll say, I'll, I'll tell you what, if you'll call me, I'll explain it to you. I'll send you a book if you'll read it. I have YouTube videos, but you know what I'm, I hear all the time? I don't have time. I don't have time to read books. I don't like to read books. I can't sit here and watch a sermon for an hour. It's amazing how many people come to these sermons on, that we do on Facebook, and they only spend a few minutes, and they go to the next one, and they go to the next one. That's what's hindering people today, is we're not willing to sit and be taught. And we need to be taught. We need to be taught the truthful word, and it means, needs to be grounded into our hearts. So, Romans 28, 128, so by doing such, they in no way discerned Father in full awareness and acknowledgement, nor that they were a whole person, not spirit, soul, and body. And right there, Paul's saying the same thing, because they won't sit and listen, or they, they won't pay attention to the comforter messengers that Father sent us, then they continue that way. And what happens is they gave up the knowledge of the union with Father purposely, for a worthless degenerate awareness, our intellect, our will to do things that become that that were not becoming to man. That's verse twenty-eight. Verse twenty-nine. It says this all resulted in them being full and replete with injustice, with a false immoral character of life. No longer were they experienced the rest of father. They were eager for more and more sensual pleasures, full of ill will, murder, strife, deceit, mischievousness, and slander. They begin to learn from their own experience, uh, gaining information from their senses. They uttered untruths and attempted to deceive by falsehood. 
Now, when you hear that phrase, they learn from one's own experience, it would make you think of the word, if you studied with us very long, the word nakash in the Hebrew. The word serpent in scripture came from the Hebrew word nakash, N-A-C-A-S-H, which is to learn from one's own sense experience. Nakash, I would say nakash signifies a group of thoughts in the life center in man that believes in wisdom and revelation to be attained by experience and sense awareness. They think they can get all their understanding and their wisdom by the five senses, and they're wrong, right? You can't, because your senses can lie to you. So in, in uh, verse 30, they became irreverent to father, uh, dis, uh, despiteful, thinking themselves to be better than others, braggarts, contrivers of things, and degenerate from their true virtue, not listening to their father with intelligence, and I could say not having a comforter teacher in their life. And I'll explain to you why I say that, because father told Jeremiah something. I'll share that with you in just a little bit. So their design, uh, only sensual pleasure, or only spiritual pleasure, if you would, stole substance that should go to upbuilding the entire person as one with Father. When all you're interested in is spiritual experiences or physical experiences, then you're not experiencing Father. And you're always talking about how the Holy Spirit did this day and the Holy Spirit did this today, but you're not really experiencing Father. So Jesus said the thief comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. Or we can say, the law of doing to be produces corrupted conscious awareness, which produces unbelief as to whom we are. And that awareness kills, steals, and destroys life. It, it, nothing can take life from you, but it can destroy your experience of life. I have life in me. You have life in you. Zoe life inside of us. But if our awareness is off, then we're not drawing from that. So I am present, he said, that I that your Zoe life is taken hold of by you and it be experienced in exceedingly abundantly above beyond measure and permanency. Most people say when Jesus said he came to bring life and life more abundantly, it's not translated properly. They think that we didn't have it. But really what he said is I came to bring an awareness of that and cause you to wake up to it. So there again, when you look at scripture, you got to think this is about an awareness. It's not about him bringing something to me. So they wasted, if you would, they wasted, uh, it, it, it ki- they, 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 they let it be killed, if you would, they, they let it be stolen, they let it be destroyed in their awareness. We've sat in churches all over the world, or religious establishments, and we let them literally rob us of the truth of who we are and literally put us to sleep. So they destroyed that true substance of the divine and many sense sensations. When you're reaching for, for satisfaction in the sense world, then you're not drawing from the divine mind. You're not drawing from your renewing mind. So their actions became a thief of divine life by seeking this seemingly power and strength and dominion by magnifying the spiritual part of their body or soulish lust. And that's not good. And it produced things that were not good. And so it's easy for mankind, if you would, to accept as true these ideas and these habits because it seems to be a universal belief. I mean, you can go back through history and go through all the the writers that are early Christian church and everything, and they all believe these things. They all believe penal penal substitution because that's what the, the translators put in the original doctrine. So it's easy to believe this stuff. After all, everybody believes it, right? So it's gotta be true. Well, no, it doesn't. And so there are many religions that are built up on this magnification of spirit or magnification of soul or magnification of the material. And they determine your spiritual knowledge by your ability to get nice cars and nice houses. And, you know, somebody put a post on Facebook the other day, he had a really nice car, an expensive car, and his tag said, I tithe. Well, that's ridiculous. You don't have that car because you tithe, but yet they were taught that. So... Furthermore, uh, major parts of the Western evangelical Christianity major their entire beliefs on the, on the Mosaic law and the wrong translation of scripture. And that's why uh, the crowd's awareness and desires, they're almost always wrong. But because of that, they brand people that teach the truth with all kinds of words. As of the week that I studied this last week, uh, I made a post on Facebook about Father not being the author of the law of Moses or the due to be laws. And I was surprised that many pastors of different charismatic churches or religions were reading my post. 
And I guess they're connected because I looked at them and they said that we were connected. But I'm telling you, they had a, lot, a hard time, most of them. Most of them were enraged. I was called a heretic by a few. Some said I committed heresy and were telling people that were sharing that post not to follow me. And so, I, you know what? I consider myself in good company because Jesus was called that and Paul was called that and the disciples were too and many people before us. But uh, what is a heretic? Well, it's somebody that uh, is teaching a belief or opinion contrary to the orthodox religious or specifically Christian doctrine. So if you say anything or bring any light on a subject that people have believed forever and, and religion has taught it forever, then again, it is very hard and they think it is heresy. But I received a few calls and another person is going to be calling me and they're going to let me explain it to them. And that's important. I always say, you should never say, I don't believe something. You should say, I don't understand, but please, would you explain me, uh, give me more, explain more, and then people can understand. But we still live in a time when it's hard to share the not concealed word, as Jesus called it, uh, with people who still put their faith in what over 45,000 Christian religions teach. That alone should tell people something's wrong. If they're all Christian, then why aren't they all teaching the same thing? that makes sense? If they're all Christian, they should all be teaching the same thing. We shouldn't be having all these different names of churches. They should be teaching the same. So now we can see why in verse 31, they were unaware of the truth. How many people are unaware of the truth today? Millions are. Mm -hmm. They were unaware of the truth and without father's rest. They were foolish, covenant breakers, and hard-hearted toward their kindred, showing no mercy. I mean, I'm telling you, I have friends that I've grown up with that are this way with me because of what I teach. They show me no mercy. They think that I, they think I've gone off the wagon or whatever, but they were foolish, it says. Verse 32, although they knew the decree, the decision, and declaration of Father at the foundation of the world, they willingly chose to be unaware of the consequences of committing such things. People today, the majority, do not know the decree, the decision, or the declaration of Father because their pastors have not taught them. And they've not taken time to study themselves to see what Father said. Uh, Paul told, uh, who was it? I uh, can't think who it was. I should know. The young, the, the young ministry told him, uh, he told him, a workman needeth not be ashamed if he'll study himself and... Timothy. Timothy, thank you. He told Timothy, a workman needeth not be ashamed if he'll study himself to show himself approved of God. It doesn't mean to study so God will approve. No, you need to study yourself and show yourself that God has approved of you. Then you can never be lied to again. So when you live unaware, as a result, they live being as dead to Father, uh, which I'm going to talk about dead a lot today, but that's with a false sense of being void of abundant life. If you think you're void of abundant life, if you think you've lost the glory of Father, if you think you're just a sinner saved by grace, then you're living as dead. What they did is they manifested this lower realm life. Besides, they also thought well of themselves and their actions and felt gratified with themselves and others who repeatedly and hab habitually did the same thing. So that ends uh, chapter 1. And I want to deal with some things here out of that. Why did they continue to live as dead to Father? Why do people today continue to live as dead to Father? Not just other religions, but even Christianity. Why do they live as dead to Father? It was because they would not listen to their pastors who were comforter messengers. They would not seek him out. They did not have time to come to listen. They did not have time to read their writings. Uh, they, did not, uh, they, they were too busy with other things all, uh, that offered pleasures of the senses, if you would. And so Father told Jeremiah, I will give you pastors after my awareness. Now in the King James, it says my heart, but it's my awareness. I will give you pastors after my awareness. Says, Who shall feed you with knowledge and understanding? I, I don't get why people won't come to, to be taught knowledge and understanding when there are churches that do it. And if you're in a city that doesn't have churches, then there are those on the internet. There's me, there's Kay's, there's Don Keithley's, there's other ministers out there that you can go to and you can feed on truth. And I hope everybody's staying with the truth. But Father did that, did that then. In every generation, he sent comforter messengers and pastors who would teach the living word. So 
the degenerative, uh, the degenerative function, which generate, if you would, the degenerative function of the body were given over to the expression of spirit or soulish lust. And that came from living with a sense consciousness, not a oneness consciousness, or a sin consciousness, not a one consciousness. And so the, the substance of this ruling energies are given over uh, to use our functions and it hinders the, the regeneration of our body. It hinders true spiritual sense expression. Our senses were given to us, they're good, but they're for us to, exp to, ex uh, to express Father's nature. They're there for us to love people and to touch people and to bless people and not just to get stuff for us. So in our book on no penal substitution, uh, we wrote the cross of Calvary did nothing to us or for us, it did, it, and certainly it did nothing for God, but he remains to say, but it did something, uh, or it remains to say that it did something for man's awareness. And that's why the crucified died buried. We can look at that and we can tr and get tremendous awareness out of that, of what Father wanted us to know about that old way of living. And so we see that we were never separate from Father. We see that Father always loved Jesus. There was, he, he allowed Jesus to be resurrected. He didn't leave him dead, if you would. And our Father is love. Our Father uh, can do nothing but love. He cannot relate to us in any way that doesn't include love. So if we think we have a vengeful God or angry God or a God that hates people that do the things that Paul talked about, we're wrong because he's only love. So we need this awareness of Father revealed to us uh, constantly. We need to consistently hear what Father told the first race. He said, what, where are you at? Why, why aren't you here? And they said, well, we've been feeding from, the, uh, excuse me, they said we were naked. And then he said, you mean you were feeding from teachers who taught the knowledge of good and bad? Because that's what trees represent. And they thought they were naked. They thought they were embraced. And how did they think that? Because they embraced the great lie of separateness. So whenever we hear things that are contrary to the truth of the gospel, we need to ask ourselves, who told me that? And the truth is it wasn't Father. One of our previous piano players and songwriters, Judy Vandenberg, she wrote a wonderful song, Who Told You That? Who have you been listening to? You're not naked, you wear a righteous suit, or literally you are righteous. So sadly, not enough people have heard that truthful word or spent much time in their life listening uh, to the truth because they listen to familiar voices that they've been used to all their life. So Father did not punish the first race of man. Now let me get ahead here. I want to just get a little... Okay, so in verse 32 of chapter 1, in my translation... I use the phrase, as a result, they live being as dead as father with a false sense of being void and abundant life. The point there is, is they were not physically dead, but they lived as dead. We could say they lived as walking dead people because they were not living out of their inward substance, out of their inward abundant life that belonged to them. When most people read the word dead in scripture or any doc document, they think that's the cessation of life. They think the body no longer functions. But in the Bible, dead has, most of the time, has nothing to do with that. It's dead in their awareness. So our desire at Free Life Ministries is to raise the dead. Not physically, but those who are dead in their conscious awareness and the, who are mindful to material things and carnal things rather than being mindful to the divine mind. So whenever truth is declared, whenever truth is proclaimed, whenever truth is decreed, uh, it reveals those who are dead in their awareness, and again, some come very, become very angry. And that's where they're at. They're dead in their awareness of the truth. So we see that during Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas, the ones who were deeply ingrained in the Mosaic Law, they became very angry, and they wanted to get rid of Jesus. They wanted to get him out of there. They were angry with the disciples. They were angry with Paul. Later on, Paul was stoned to death for what he was preaching, but he raised himself back up and he continued his ministry until later they, they sent him to be decapitated. And he allowed that to happen. And there was a reason for that. So in 1 Peter 4, 5, it says, Who shall give account to him that is ready to, to distinguish the quick and the dead? So the dead in scriptures are those who are unconscious of truth. That's important for us to understand that. Every place you see in Bible where it talks about the dead, there's an awareness. Huh? 
knowledge. No knowledge, no understanding. They don't have pa pastors, comfort or messengers that can teach them with the truthful knowledge and, and understanding. The quick, which means alive, are those who are conscious of truth. Both are physically alive and both are whole, but one is aware and the other is not. One is dead to being in contact with Father, the other is alive to being in contact with Father. Right? There's scripture where it said the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which remain, you know, who are alive. That's knowledge, that's understanding. There, there, there are a lot of people who are dead in contact with Father. They have no understanding, but I believe they're rising all over the world and they're waking up. And I found this interesting. I like to look up words, uh, name meanings in the old covenant books or the old outlook books, if you would. But one of the sons of Ishmael was Duma, D-U-M-A-H. Uh, you can almost say Duma. There's another one that's almost like that. But Duma means mute, dumb as in ignorant, silence, land of silence. And Sheol, S-H-E-O-L. Now, what is that? In the Old Testament, it says the uh, place of departed souls. And a lot of people think that's hell, you know. But it's the place of departed souls as in a lower conscious awareness and a tomb. So when man left the cool of the day experience, because the Father said, where are you? Because it said Father walked with them in the cool of the day. When they left that experience and cut themselves off of the knowledge of God, they lowered themselves down to carnal thinking and the lower realm. That's all it is. So that's the place of departed souls. So spiritually, the name Duma symbolizes the condition that man calls death, mute, dumb, land of silence, Sheol, a tomb, also the state of man wherein he is dead. Hmm. He's not able to speak truth through his trespasses and through his mistaken identity. And like I've explained this before, there are a lot of things I don't know and I don't understand, so I don't, I'm, I'm mute to that. I'm ignorant to those things. Uh, when I first met my son-in-law, he was really, and he still is, but he was really into football. And I had to sit there and just be quiet because he was talking about things that I didn't know anything about. And we've all been in different places like that. So that's what this means. They're dead. They're not able to speak truth to because of their trespasses and their mistaken identity. They've gone to all the wrong places for love. So one of Jesus' mandates was to raise mankind out of their mistaken identity, not just to raise people from the dead. And he did. He raised them from the physical death because he had to meet them where they're at. But he wanted to raise them out of their mistaken identity. And continuing with a mistaken identity caused by relig religiosity leads to the death experience. We sit in churches all the time that's not teaching spiritual truth, and it's just literally putting us to sleep because we're spiritually asleep. Right? If we were not spiritually asleep and we were awake, we wouldn't stay there, would we? And so one must be awakened out of his or her belief in limitation. We must be awakened out of our belief in false identity and disease and in harmony and being mortal because mortal means liable to die. And uh, in order to become established and abiding uh, uh, to, to do that, we want to be able to, uh, to abide in an omnipresent life. But until we, until we lay those things down, we'll never live in that omnipresent life and knowing who we are. And so uh, there was a hill country, I looked up today, of Judah, and it signifies a high consciousness of honor, and it signifies conversation with Father. I love that. A high conscious of, consciousness of honor and a conversation with Father. So through conversing words and through hearing Father speak to our thoughts and through speaking the truth of life based on Father's decision, then one is raised up of a sin and death consciousness that Father never did give him. If, if, let's just say you think I don't like you. For some reason, you don't think, I'll, uh, and you never talk to me very much, but you think I don't like you, and you've heard bad things about me. You've heard people say that I'm an angry person, I'm very hard to please, and you have to do things to satisfy me. Well, if you would come and sit down and have conversation with me, you would find out that's a lie. You would find out that would be an untruth, so you would be raised out of that awareness, and that's what Jesus came to do. That's what Father's desire is. That's what Paul's desire was. That's what true comforter ministers desire is to do, is to raise us from that. And that's why, Father, this post I wrote about Abraham and Isaac and, uh, the other day, and where it did not say bring him up to sacrifice him, 
father asked Abraham to bring Isaac to a high mountain. And he said, I'll show you which one to come to, to have a conversation. That's all it was about. He wanted to converse with him and let him know that I am not like the gods that you worship. I'm not like Balak. I'm not like Baal. I'm not like those other gods that you worship. I need no appeasement. I need no sacrifice. All I want to do is love you. And anytime you see a high place and where God calls people up to mountaintop, it's to have a conversation. Same thing with Moses. I do not believe God only brought him up there to say, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. I don't believe though that he brought him up. I believe he ha was there to give him a conversation uh, about truth and about what he wanted the people to be taught. But Moses was so angry with the people that he twisted all that around and came up with laws to control them. That's what I believe. So like a young man in the days of the Apostle Paul, I was kind of led to this yesterday. If you allow yourself to go to sleep spiritually, that is, if you live in, this, uh, in a sense realm and you fail to recognize your spiritual selfhood of a whole man in your relationship, you're already virtually dying in your dead conscious awareness. And you fall prey to man's laws that, uh, to appease father. So here's the good news, and I'm closing here. This man's uh, young man na name is uh, Eutychus. He was a young man that lived at Tross, T-R-O-A-S. And because he was going to sleep during Paul's talk, he fell from the upper chamber and they perceived him to be dead, or he was dead. But the good news is Paul restored life back to him. The good news is there are many comforter messengers who like Jesus and who like Paul can breathe the breath of life into you and revive you from this false state of sleep. If you are one, that's new to listening to this and it, it confuses you and it's totally contrary to what all your pastors have taught you before, but you realize that you're living as dead. You realize that you really don't have a lot of awareness. You realize that you don't really know Father. I'm telling you, there are comforter ministers, not just me, Kay Fairchild. There's others. There's got to be all over the world that people can go to and they breathe that life back into you. And how do they do that? They speak the living word. And we're going to see where Paul embraced this young man. But we embrace you for who you are. We don't preach against homosexuality or lesbianism or, or murder or rape or anything. Of course, we don't agree with it, but we don't preach against it. We don't condemn you. We embrace you. We embrace Christians that are just is just doing uh, in much uh, the same struggle, but it's a religious bondage that they're in. They're embracing the wrong religious system. And so we embrace you and we begin to breathe the, the living word in you, which lifts you up. And so the, the good news there is that this can take place and it takes you out of the false state of sleep. If you're not awake, if you're not in a place where light comes in, because where was this man sitting? You know where he was sitting, Donna, this young man? He was in a window. So what is a window? It's a place where light comes in. But the thing is, is he was in that window, but he was spiritually dead. And there's a lot of places are setting in windows called churches that are supposed to be places where light's coming through and they've been put spiritually dead to carnally mindful messages. So let's read this. Where is it at? In uh, Acts 20 and 9. And what's really interesting, this morning I looked up Eutychus's name and guess what it means? It means fortunate. Fortunate. What do you mean fortunate? Well, let's see. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus being fallen into a deep sleep. See, that's that dead state of, of you know, he, he had no spiritual awareness. He wasn't even aware that who he was in the presence of. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. Well, I didn't write a lot about the third, but the, there's a, the third is a, you know, like out of court, holy place, most holy place, third, if you would, a, a third level of heavenly awareness. So he fell from the third loft, if you would. He fell from that because he, he couldn't understand. And so he was taken up dead and Paul went down and fell on him and embraced him and said, trouble not yourself for his life is in him. 
So what did Paul do? He embraced him. He didn't say it serves you right. He didn't have a sermon say, well, this is what happens to people that reject me or reject teaching or don't tithe right. And I've had that told to me many times. But he fell on him, he embraced him, and he breathed life back into him. And he brought. So, so he, he, it, that's important. And he said, don't worry or don't be worried for breath is in his body. So figuratively, we could say he embraced him, he breathed upon him, and he breathed life. And I'm telling you, it is fortunate. That's his name. It is fortunate that Eutychus was in a place where there was a true comforter messenger who could breathe living words into him. And that's what people need. I'm not trying to get you to come to me. You're already listening to me. But I'm just saying there are other people that need to find a comforter messenger. And I believe if they're desiring that, Father can lead them to that. Why wait until you're almost dead? Really, why? To allow that to take place in your life. Why not realize that there, there's, there's some greater awareness that I can go after? If you're a preacher out there that's in a denomination, you need to realize what you're doing is just not working. It's not working because people in churches are not any different than people that are out of church, that aren't serving God. And so we do the same thing as we preach, we teach, we explain the truthful word. And yes, we can do the same thing that Paul did. We can do the same thing that Jesus did. The understanding that this youthful energies of the whole person can be quickened and to people's lives to, to bring newness of life, to revivify their life, if you would. And even after they appear to be utterly dead in their consciousness, and it seems hopeless, it's not hopeless. Hopeless, because we are fortunate in having the living word of truth, and it's here for all people. All people. And this is something I speak daily, and this is something that you should. I, I, and this is, uh, this is a conversation that you should have daily with the Father, because all the Father wants is to converse with you and love you, answer your questions and help you and don't do it by sight or don't do it because we don't want to walk by sight physical sight and don't do it by faith in yourself do it by faith in father's faith father has great faith in you father has great faith in me and we don't want to believe the lie that came from the very beginning that we can do it ourselves, and we don't need father we need father all the time so to be dead is no knowledge of father no knowledge of who you are, no knowledge of the abundant life that you have inside of you. And uh, again, if you have a comforter messenger, you're fortunate. And I would, if you don't, then I would seek for one. If you don't have one in your city, begin to pray that one be raised up or that you be raised up to do that thing, that same thing and bless other people. Because there's a lot of people who are still dead in their awareness and they need help. They're really, they're praying to God, asking for help not knowing that there's people all around them that can help them. So I hope that you enjoy this today. And I assume that you are fortunate, the, more, uh, the majority of you that follow this or listen to this. And I hope you heard the whole thing. If you didn't, I encourage you to go back from the beginning and listen to it and then share it with your friends and your loved ones and your friends on Facebook. We bless you very much and have a great day. Thank you.